Welcome to Darkest Night, Season 2, Episode 7. Brought to you by Blue Apron, which is the number one fresh ingredient recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. And we all use Blue Apron here, and I freaking love it. Like, I'm someone who doesn't have a lot of time, I'm always on the go, but I really like to cook and I like to make food, and this is a way I can make really great meals for 40 minutes or less. You have all the ingredients there. I can incorporate some Axiom Zero Spice to give it a little extra punch. Yep. And you know, Axiom Zero is available on our website, www.darkestnightpod.com. And what's great is it's easy, it's fast, and there's a lot to choose from. So no matter what your dietary restrictions are or anything, you can do what you need to do. At yeah, Blue Mutt Apron. and Jeff, that's great. Listen, some of my favorite meals include seared chicken and creamy pasta salad with summer squash and sweet peppers. I also enjoy fresh basil fettuccine pasta with sweet corn and cubanelle pepper. Yeah. And that's just some of their upcoming meals. They will never repeat the same meal twice within a year, which is pretty freaking cool. All of this is less than $10 per person per meal. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash darkest night. That's blueapron.com slash darkest night. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Rob Lotto Center for Advanced Research. Project Cyclops, day 16, about to begin. Entering the laboratory now. Katie. Dr. Ricketts, good morning so far? It's adequate. Most people just say fine. Most people read at the third grade level. Yes, Dr. Ricketts, I'm doing well this morning too. Thanks for asking. What are you working on? The recurring instances of perception control in several of our recent case studies led me to investigate certain pharmaceutical trials performed by research laboratories. Like the Sabre formulation, which we know was manufactured right here at the center. For all we know, that was the beta test for what we've been seeing. Yes, the Sabre formula was developed here, and while I know that nothing would please you more than to draw a line back to our doorstep with your conspiracy theories, what we've been seeing looks a lot more like the early research of one Dr. Damien Igwe. Igwe? Igwe, that, that name sounds familiar. He should. Dr. Igwe's professor now. He's also- Effie's father. The kid who took control of the Pledge Master from Omicron. Correct. What department does Dr. Igwe work for? See for yourself. Well, this can't be. This isn't Roth Lobdo data. Precisely. Dr. Igwe works for Sigma Corp? Dr. Igwe is inconsequential. He's one of many who worked at Sigma Corp. He's not even working there anymore, as far as I can tell. But what that data shows is that the beta development of whatever it is we're seeing actually began at Sigma. Not here. I just need to mull this over. If there's one thing I've learned about working at the center, it's that there's always something in the shadows worth chasing if the shadows aren't already chasing you. Well, suit yourself. I was just trying to provide you with some facts. What you do with them is up to you. Hmm. Shall we get to work? Let's. Subject appears to be mid-twenties, face and head more or less intact. Are those teeth marks on the neck? Removing optic nerve. Project Cyclops trial seven zeta six. Timestamp is registering correctly. Initiating playback in three, two, one, initiate. Paramedics just brought her in. Adult female, looks to be in her mid-thirties. Experienced blunt force trauma and multiple lacerations. Massive blood loss. Get her on the table. Got it. Montrose! Here! This woman is going to need a transfusion. She's running out of blood. And even if we close her up, she's not going to live if there's nothing left in there. Yes, Dr. Alvarez. As the nurses struggle to move the body from the stretcher to the operating table, Dr. Alvarez quickly surveyed the situation. Pale and beaded with sweat, the woman's clothes were drenched in blood. The thick, coppery scent of her insides filled the surgical theater. And even the medical staff, with their steely resolves, had to momentarily center themselves to stop from gagging. She does not look good. Understatement of the year. Vitals? Weak. Fading. Then you're going to need to think about getting these wounds closed sooner rather than later. Start suturing. On it. And where's my transfusion prep? I only have two hands, sir. 
Dr. Alvarez. I'm busy, nurse. I understand that, sir, but a woman in the waiting room just started seizing. The admit crew is understaffed and they need someone to check on her pronto. <sighs> damn it. Fine, Steve, you're with me. Sir. And Montrose, get that damn transfusion prepped so I can start it when I get back. On it. Recently transferred to the hospital after a number of years working in private care, the young nurse, Steve, was finding his new job to be even more stressful than he had initially imagined. He had already seen an early onset Alzheimer's patient commit suicide in his first few weeks on the job. Still, as he worked with Dr. Alvarez in the lobby to quell the convulsing of the elderly woman, the young man couldn't help but feel a small sense of pride. Tonight, Steve had done good, and no one could take that feeling from him. <clears throat> She's stabilized. But, the night was young. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Of course. A staff member will be by momentarily to take your grandmother to a room for further checkup. But in the meantime, both myself and Steve here need to attend to some other patients. Thank you, again. Just keep her still and calm, and someone will be along shortly. Steve! Yes, doctor. Now, Montrose, that patient better be prepped for transfusion. What is this? Stopping at the foot of the operating table, Alvarez's eyes were fixed on a tube running from the woman's vein into a thick plastic bag hovering above her on an IV stand. A dark scarlet liquid traveled through the length of the tube into the woman. Blood. The transfusion, it seemed, had occurred without the doctor's steady hand. It's exactly that. A transfusion. Remember, like the one you ordered? Or did you also suffer a seizure in the lobby? Yes, I ordered the damn transfusion, but I didn't clear you to do the procedure. Did you even match the blood type? I didn't do the procedure. The other doctor did. What other doctor? I don't know. He came in after you and left. He was credentialed. I saw the hospital ID. He told me he had it handled. He's a doctor. I'm a nurse. That's how it works. I took it as my cue to go assist another patient. I don't know of any other doctor on the floor in this ward tonight. Well, you had to have passed him on your way back in here. He left just seconds before you walked in. Steve? I didn't see anybody. Look, I don't know every doctor in this hospital, and I know you don't either. The important thing is that she's stable. I can take her vitals, then go find the other doctor to ease your mind. And for paperwork. Mm. Yes, I suppose that's... Oh my god! What? The woman on the table's body rocketed upward, the arc of her back convulsing in time with her screams. Small flecks of crimson escaped her mouth in a bloody mist with each renewed shriek. She's going into cardiac arrest. Since when does cardiac arrest look like this? Sir! Steve! Stabilize her! Montrose, get her sedated! Now! As Steve moved to grab and stabilize the thrashing woman, Nurse Montrose rushed to her side with a syringe loaded with a heavy-grade sedative. However, any designs the nurse had on sinking the needle into the patient's skin were immediately shattered. With a lightning-quick movement, the patient's hand flashed out toward Montrose's, plucking the syringe from her unsuspecting fingers. Just as quickly, the hysterical woman reversed the syringe's trajectory, stabbing it directly into Montrose's chest. <coughs> the nurse stumbled backward before crashing to the floor. Damn it, Steve, I told you to stabilize her! I'm trying! With a backward snap of her head, the patient's skull collided with Steve's. Ah, fuck! The young nurse stumbled backward, hitting the floor. Steve! With his assistance dispatched, Alvarez was left staring at the hysterical woman. Surging forward, the woman started pulling herself toward Alvarez. The tube of the IV ripped free, and blood began to spill on the floor. The patient opened her mouth again for what Alvarez presumed was another shriek. Instead, she spoke to him for the first time. It burns! What? What burns? My insides! My veins! They burn! It's... It's in my blood! My blood! Your blood? Burns! Lurching toward Alvarez, the woman's open jaw began to emit something more than just a scream. A thick dark vial began to spew forth from the patient's mouth, splattering the front of the doctor's uh. suit. 
After a moment, the flow stopped, and the woman locked eyes with the alarmed doctor. It's inside me. The woman fell forward, unconscious. Cautiously, Alvarez stepped forward and checked her vitals. Hmm. Stable. What the fuck just happened? That's what I'd like to know. Steve! Uh, uh, let me help get you up. Thanks. What about Montrose? Out cold. She got a tit full of sedative. I imagine she's going to be out for a while, and judging by the way she hit the floor, she's going to be very sore when she wakes up. We should get her to a bed. What do we do about her? The two men turned to look at the unconscious body of the woman on the operating table, framed by the pooled blood of the leaking IV bag. That, my friend, is the million dollar question. With the patient incapacitated and whatever brought on her hysterical episode having since passed, the woman had been moved from the operating theater to a small hospital room for observation. Unfortunately for Steve, he happened to be the nurse in the room when the woman finally decided to rejoin the waking world. Oh. You're awake. My head. Where am I? Why? Why are you all the way over there? Uh, well, the last time you woke up wasn't exactly a safe space, so I'm keeping a respectable distance. What are you talking about? You're a nurse? Yes. This is a hospital. You don't remember? Hospital? The woman stared into space for a moment. The flicker of recognition crossed her face. Yes, I remember. The blood. Oh God, the blood. Can you tell me your name? My name? Yes. Alana. My name is Alana. Alana? Yes, that is my name, but that's not who I am anymore. Because my blood. My blood. I, I, I don't understand. My blood. Whatever lucidity the woman known as Alana had briefly displayed was gone in that instant. With mounting fear, Steve watched the shift happen with paralyzed dismay. My blood is bad. Bolting up in bed, Alana launched herself from the edge of the mattress onto the floor. She approached Steve with a crazed look in her eye. I need it out of me. I can feel it in my veins. The badness. I have to get it out. I need fresh blood. Clean. It's got to be clean. Hey! Some help in here would be great! It's got to be clean! Help! Steve, what's wrong? Dr. Alvarez's interruption was enough to pull Alana's attention from the young nurse to the older man in the doorway, staring at the doctor with a look of contemptuous desire. Alana surged forward so quickly that neither Alvarez nor Steve were prepared. Propelling her body into Alvarez, ah! Alana slammed the doctor into the door jamb. With nearly imperceptible strength, the woman used her bare hand to punch hard into Alvarez's throat. Fingernails digging in, Alana yanked backward, ripping a good hunk of Alvarez's neck with it. Hot blood spattered the surrounding wall. God! I need security! Uh, nurses! Doctors! Whoever you can send! Realizing a little late that his plea would draw Alana's attention back to him, the young nurse turned slowly to look in the direction of the enraged woman. Steve was dismayed to find she still had the bloody Alvarez pinned to the wall, but was staring directly at him. I wish you hadn't done that, Steve. Throwing a glance back toward the sound of the approaching footsteps, Alana looked back to Steve, caught in a moment of indecision as the sound of the hall drew closer. Alana wrinkled her nose in frustration. Damn it! Pulling her bloody hand free of Alvarez, Alana turned to give Steve one last hard look. Slowly she licked a string of wet red liquid from her fingertips. Giving Steve a cold wink, she turned from the room and ran. Moments later, hospital security burst into the room, but they were too late to catch the fleeing woman, or to save dear Dr. Alvarez. 
What the hell happened here? The, 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 the patient! She, she went crazy! She literally ripped out his throat! A woman did this with her bare hands? Yes! Is she on drugs? Is this bath salts? No! No! I don't think so! That must be one pissed chick. Bad blood. What? Just... Just find her, okay? Leaving the scene of Dr. Alvarez's demise, Steve walked down the hall in a daze. The cacophony of hospital security becoming background noise the farther he walked down the hall. What? What is happening? What? What is even happening? Oh God! No! Running toward the screams, Steve's stomach began to sink as he followed the sound. Please no! Already expecting the worst. His dread only increased as he realized the path he was traveling through the hospital's cold corridors would lead him straight to the children's ward. Rounding the corner into the ward, Steve felt the cold grip of nausea seize him. Streaked at odd intervals across the wallpaper, once upon a time colorful to cheer the children, was spatters of blood. Red handprints and splotches now staining it throughout. What? What? Slumped on the floor in the middle of the hall, a nurse, the source of the screams, lay in shock. <laughs> Heaving with sobs, the woman was alive, but very much incapable of expressing herself with speech as Steve approached. Turning from the hall into a nearby room, Steve finally laid eyes on what had stricken the woman in her tracks the remains of at least three patients, children, lay savaged across the floor, throats lashed with precision, the blood around each of their necks had light tracks, swirl marks, similar to how ice cream looks when someone drags their tongue across the surface. Steve felt his stomach drop. Glancing up at the hall toward the row of other open doors, Steve couldn't bear to walk further and confirm what he already suspected. Fuck! Most of them were sleeping. They never knew. Turning, Steve saw Alana standing behind him, drenched from head to toe in the blood of children. She was a red specter illuminated by the hospital's harsh fluorescent lighting. Clutched in her fist was a surgical scalpel. I didn't want to, you understand, but I had to. Their blood was fresh, innocent, untainted. Where did, where did you get that? Steve motioned toward the scalpel in her hand. It's a hospital, Steve. You guess where I got it. You guys really should lock doors. Not that it matters. I would have cut them open with a rusty thumbtack if I had to. You don't understand how bad it hurts, Steve. Their blood, their blood calmed it, but it's still there. It's still there inside of me and I want it out. No more bad blood. Uh, but they were children. They were there. And now, so are you. Uh. Alana's speed was almost inhuman. No! As she ran toward Steve, the young nurse barely had time to move. Alana's body collided with his, uh. slamming Steve backward into the wall. Alana raised the scalpel with intent to kill. As the scalpel came crashing down, Steve shoved his hand, palm open, upward to block it. Rather than burying itself into his face, the scalpel made its way halfway through the bone of his hand before coming to a stop. Surprised by the development, Alana backed up to survey what had just happened. Steve used the hesitation to his advantage. Catching Alana off guard, Steve's shove sent her tumbling. As she fell away, the nurse began to run. Help! She's here! Help! Don't you fucking leave, Steve! Turning at the sound of her voice, Steve was surprised to discover Alana was almost on him. Wincing, he knew what he had to do. Using his free hand to pull the embedded scalpel out of his palm, Steve rotated the medical blade in his hand just as Alana closed the distance. With the scalpel buried deep in her breast, Alana clutched the hilt of the medical tool, blood spurting around it. You son of a bitch! Ah, that's nurse son of a bitch to you! Watching her body hit the floor, 
Steve let out a slow exhale of relief. Wearily, Steve wandered toward the end of the hall, turning to the first open room. Careful not to look at the mutilated children within, Steve walked to the room's emergency call button and stabbed it with his thumb. Get security! Children's ward! She's here. She's dead. <laughs> Fuck! Turning to the sound of entering footsteps, Steve froze. Standing in front of him was Alana, scalpel still sticking out from her chest. Despite the foreign intrusion, the woman looked relatively unfazed. She gave Steve a big, blood-stained smile. Thank you, Steve. She nodded toward the scalpel. Thank you for helping me get some of the bad blood out. What the hell? And thank you for helping me let the good blood in. Grabbing Steve by the collar, <sighs> Alana yanked the young nurse toward her forcefully. Fatigued by shock, the sense of defeat that washed over him was almost comforting in a way. As her teeth tore into the small of his neck and his own hot blood began to spill down both of their torsos, he couldn't help but think he had done good and no one could take that feeling from him. Well, Steve, you've been a real treat. Attention all Roth Lobdo Health Center security personnel. Report to the paramedic ICU immediately. But that's my cue. Letting go of Steve's lifeless body, Alana used the back of her hand to wipe remnants of the young man from her lips. Temporarily satiated, the blood-drenched woman began to take stock of her surroundings. As the footfall of approaching security grew nearer, Alana's eyes laid at last upon a window in the room's corner. Bingo! Come on, Steve. Looks like I'll need you just a little bit longer after all. As the security made their entrance to the ward, they were barely able to take full stock of the vision of carnage in the hallway before a loud noise. The shattering of glass pulled their focus. It came from down there! Entering the hospital room that Alana had occupied only moments before, the security team instead found it vacant. It only took the briefest of moments to ascertain the source of the sound they heard in the hall. The room's window, now a gaping maw, was broken outward. What the? Crossing the room, a member of the security detail peered through the shattered frame, careful to avoid the few jagged shards that remained. There, on the ground below, he saw the shredded, mangled body of Steve. Next to him, Several bloody footprints strayed away from the corpse before fading, like the creature that made them, into the night. Did we just see what I think we saw? What do you think we saw? Don't make me say it. Say what? Vampire. A ward full of children was murdered, and you want to talk about vampires. But don't think I'm not horrified by what she did. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around it. She killed those kids for their blood, Dr. Ricketts. And she bit today's subject to drink his. I know it seems scientifically unsound, but the increased strength... Adrenaline. The ability to survive being stabbed... He may not have hit a vital organ. And that the thirst for blood all seem to suggest something beyond the norm. And it could just be madness. I'm not disputing that we saw a monster today, Katie. But monsters can be very much human. What about the fact that the woman from today's projection is the same assassin lady that we saw yesterday? I'm sure you noticed. I did! And in my time on Project Cyclops, I have never seen an individual two days in a row figure centrally into the playbacks. This isn't just a coincidence. Somebody wanted us to see what happened to her, and how she was transformed by the tainted blood, I, I guess? And what about the fact that Steve was the same nurse that used to care for Vivian's mother? There's no such thing as coincidence at the center. Maybe not, but right now you're just grasping at straws. What happened to our agreement, Ms. Reed? You can't go upstairs and proclaim that the dead have risen and they're hungry for blood. Even in a place where crazy things happen, there's a limit to what's considered acceptable insanity. You're right, but if this person is out there and if there's a potential for this to happen to others, we have to find out. We have to stop it. No! We have to file this lab report so that we can keep our jobs. Dr. Ricketts. Small steps, Katie. Small steps. It's harder to slay vampires if you're unemployed. <sighs> now grab a pen. Let's get to work. Okay. But if I smell like garlic tomorrow, you'll know why. 
There's no scientific basis that that would even be effective. I need to get some fresh air. <laughs> Rath Lab to Center for Advanced Research, Project Cyclops, day 16, completed. We are also so excited to announce that the first episode of our behind the scenes podcast, Talkus Night, is out now on Shudder. Go and check it out. Also, if you can't wait to listen to the next episode of Darkest Night, go to Shudder.com. Shudder is a new kind of streaming video service devoted to the best horror movies available from around the world. On Shudder, you can listen to Darkest Night ad-free a week early in lossless sound quality and even receive exclusive access to bonus content like our behind-the-scenes podcast, Talkus Night. For a free month, go to Shudder.com and use the offer code Darkest Night. That's Shudder.com, offer code Darkest Night.